Welcome to Apostolic Life in the 21st Century, a podcast dedicated to helping modern day believers live out the teachings of the first century church. This podcast is part of the teaching ministry of Dr. David K. Bernard. Dr. Bernard has dedicated his life to studying the Bible and helping believers apply its message to their daily lives. In Apostolic Life in the 21st Century, Dr. Bernard answers your questions about what the Bible teaches and how those teachings apply to everyday life. Thank you for joining us for this broadcast. In Psalm 101.3, David said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Now, early Pentecostals established guidelines to try to protect themselves from moral impurity, particularly in the popular culture and in the media. But I, I don't think that probably either King David or our Pentecostal pioneers ever envisioned a world in which they could access the worst kinds of moral filth in just a matter of a few seconds using a device like a smartphone. This, it's very tricky for Christians today because the same technology that we use to transact our, our business and to manage our daily affairs can also destroy our souls. Considering the pervasiveness of evil and the accessibility of it in our world, what can Christians in this present day do to protect ourselves from being unnecessarily exposed to wickedness and immorality and fulfill what David said in Psalm 101.3? That's a very important question for, for every Christian today. And I would, I've seen a shift in my lifetime from the point where you could say, you could set some simple rules that would guard you in the majority of instances. So don't have a television. Uh, don't go to a store that sells pornography. And pretty much, or, or don't go to certain places where, uh, you know, there, there are certain activities. So for some towns, it might be the pool hall or, might be the bowling alley or the skating rink. Well, don't go there because that's where everybody congregates to pick up people and they're dressed in modestly and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, those days are pretty much gone, as you mentioned. The culture has changed, and really almost every cultural event is permeated with a worldly atmosphere. So even going to your local high school or college or going to a shopping mall, you're, you are exposed to, or a restaurant, you're exposed to a level of... Um, immodesty and secularism and drinking and profanity and et cetera, uh, that you could isolate yourself from in generations gone by in the same way with media. Uh, so now uh, everybody pretty much is going to have a computer or a smartphone or, um, you know, a tablet. And even if you don't have it for home, you need it for school, for work, for just so many things. Uh, so how do you guard yourself? So we've got to start with the basics. First, the shift has to become from external rules to internal guidance, which is really the New Testament principle. Um, God said, I'm going to put my laws on your heart, not on stone, but in your heart. So it has to start with a life, a personal relation with God. That's number one. A prayer, studying God's Word, the psalmist said, I put your word in my heart that I wouldn't sin against you. So as we internalize the word, and of course, being faithful to our local church, hearing preaching and teaching, getting involved in the social activities of church, making friends and connections in a wholesome way with, depending on your age, the youth group, young families, men's ministries, women's ministries. So all that has to do with your relation with God. That's first. Second, your relationship with people. So if you're married, you're, you have to have a strong relation with your spouse. Um, if you're single, you need to have good relationships with friends, same sex and opposite sex, but it has to be in a wholesome context. And you know who's dragging you down, and you have to minimize your time with them. Uh, you know who's a good influence and not who's a good influence. And so you surround yourself with positive influences. You surround yourself with mentors. Uh, you have a close relationship, if possible, if your family's in the church, if you're a young adult, have a good relationship with your godly parent uh, and with your pastor. So your relation with God, then your relation with others. And by the way, I will say, you know, as a single uh, young man, I, had, I, I was a single adult for seven years in college, university. I faced all the temptations that are normal for a single adult in modern America. Um, but just because... So it's easy from that perspective to think, oh, well, once I get married, 
You know, all my temptations will go away. I won't struggle with pornography or I won't struggle with this or that because, hey, I'll be married. But you know what? If you don't get a hold of it and have personal disciplines while you're single, no, it's not going to go away when you get married. It's just going to change forms. And then some people say, well, you know, I, I'm just born this way. I'm addicted. You know, I have, I, I'm a homosexual. I'm this. I'm that. Uh, but again, I would say, wait a minute. Uh, we all have personal responsibility for our lives. We all have to take control, and through the Holy Spirit, we can. And so there's no excuse for not living for God. Uh, now, I will say we all face temptations. I think they're common, and even if you're a preacher, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, those three, those three, three things are always with you. But you can take practical steps. So after the third step, I would say, is to manage your environment. So there are some places you just don't go because you know they're opening you up to temptation. Now, the challenge becomes now those places can be on the Internet in the privacy of your home. And so I recommend, and this is what I did very early on, putting in safeguards. There are things you can do. There are, um, we recommend Covenant Eyes. Here at UPCI, we have a relation with Covenant Eyes where for a discount you can sign up. And this monitors your use and reports to yourself and to a trusted person, your spouse or another adult. And you, and you might say, well, I don't have a real problem in this area. Why do I need this? When I first started teaching on this as a pastor, I thought, you know what? If I'm going to teach this to my young people or to my men, I need to do this myself. And I actually had a situation where I was using a computer, and it wasn't my home computer, so it didn't have the safeguards on it. And I was looking up a legal website that I'd been told about. And I was thinking, this is going to be great resources. Well, I topped, typed in the name and then instinctively put .com, where it actually was supposed to be, I think, .org. And somebody had created it like a clone site or a fake site on purpose. And suddenly, it was a pornographic website. I'm looking for this and even typing in what I think is the correct name to go to a legal resource, and suddenly, here's pornography. And I was so embarrassed and ashamed. My wife was in the other room, and so I'm pushing the button as fast as I could. And every time I push the button, I guess it must have been the design of the website, I push the button to close it out, it pops up another page, another page. And the more buttons I push, the more pages. I just had to finally just turn the whole computer off. And I was so embarrassed, I went and told my wife because I wanted to be accountable to her. My point is, you can put some safeguards on your computer that while they're not perfect and while an ingenious person can get around anything, if that's what you're intending to do, at least it protects you from inadvertent exposure. It also makes you think two or three times before you transgress the guidelines. And also, if you set up to report to someone else, that person could see that you tried to evade it or they can see that you disabled it or whatever. So I guess what I'm saying is, what do you mean, Brother Bernard? You don't, you don't trust yourself? Well, I trust the Lord, but I don't trust the flesh. And so don't give the flesh an opportunity. So my point being, just like we don't want to walk into a bar and order a Coke and sit down for an hour at the bar, or we don't go to a pornographic bookstore and see if there are any... Um, wholesome books that we could buy. We avoid obvious places where the temptation is great and the chances of failure are great. So we have to do the same online. So we set up accountability. And another good thing is uh, use your computer in a public area. If, you're, if you have roommates, if you're married, you have a family, well, just let the computer be used in, in, in your public um, area where, or your, you know, your family room. And it's just a matter of uh, it's a matter of a family culture, and I think if we do that, that will help us. Um, now, if you find yourself failing, I think one of the greatest things is to have an accountability partner. It might be your spouse, it might be your pastor, it might be another trusted mentor or leader of the church that can hold you accountable. And to me. Once somebody is is addicted, whether it's uh, pornography or sexual sin of other kinds, um, or maybe even alcohol or drugs, having some accountability partner is a great motivation because you can repent to yourself 
but there's just something about another person being involved that, that if you have a desire to be helped, you can be helped. So I do think we have to take this seriously. If I read the surveys, uh, this is these are per, pervasive problems in Christianity, and and I ha- have to think that Pentecostals are not immune. I do think we have an advantage in that we have the Holy Ghost. We have the power that many sincere people don't have. But we still have to use that power. All the power in the room it, it doesn't is not enough unless you intentionally use it. So this room is wired for electricity, but I've got to turn on the switch. There's not going to be any light until I go over there and do an intentional act. And, and so I think we as Christians have to be very intentional But the good news is the gospel works in every culture and every environment. Yes, we can live for God. And if we stumble and fall, there's grace. We have to go to God, ask for forgiveness, and keep moving forward. We might fall, but God doesn't fall. We might fail, but God doesn't fail. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, this is not an excuse to keep sinning deliberately and just at the end of the day say, okay, forgive me and wipe it clean. No, there must be an intention to change. Uh, 1 John 2, 1, right on the heels of that, says that Jesus Christ is the propitiation or sacrifice of atonement for our sins. But he says, I write these things that you sin not. So the goal is to live a holy life. So get up in the morning and pray, Lord, like the psalmist, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. And just live for God that one day. And you can. You'll you'll see that you can make right choices and be in a right environment and avoid temptations for just one day. So just do that every day. And if one day you fall, well, that's where you go. Confess it. Start the day over. And you get back on track pursuing a holy life. We can do it. We can live a moral life in an immoral world. Thank you for joining us for today's broadcast. We hope you'll make plans to join us again next time when once again we take a look at how the Bible applies to our everyday lives.